Good evening, members. Good evening, everyone. And good evening to our guests, those folks asking questions and making representations. Can I just say you're very welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Councillor Tony Jones. I chair this committee. I have a statutory notice that I'm obliged to read out. The meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the council website for two years. For those at home viewing, whether they be homes in this country or abroad, I'd like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a resources tab. Select this and the link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and the debate. That brings us to item two, apologies for absence. I have had one apology from Councillor Paul Martin, who's not able to make this evening. He's being deputised. <coughs> Excuse me. He's being deputised by Councillor Joe Bird. And I'd like to say thank you to Joe, because I know in order to attend this evening, she's pretty much travelled the length of the country despite the petrol shortage. So I'm very grateful, Joe. Thank you. That leads us to item three, members' declarations of interest. Can I invite any members to declare any interest? Members are asked to consider whether they have any disclosable pecuniary interest and or any other relevant interest in connection with any items on this agenda and if so declare them and state the nature of the interest no declarations of interest thank you thank you members before we go to item four we do have a submission being made with regard to one of our agenda items and that agenda item is agenda item 9, Dominic House in Liscard, pages 145 to 152 of your reports. And what I would ask is, with the consent of committee members, that item is debated immediately after the submission in order to facilitate our visitors to actually hear the debate on the back of their submission. Do any members strongly object or can I take it by assent and your silence that everyone is happy with that proposal? Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. That brings us to item four, the minutes. Can I ask the committee to approve the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of July. Can I have a proposer and seconder? Thank you, Councillor Hodson. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, thank you both. Anyone, any comments to the contrary? They're accepted as a true record of our last meeting then, thank you. This brings us to item five, public and member questions. I have uh, been informed that I have two questions from members of the Birkenhead Market Traders Organisation. Can I have the first question, please? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's David French. I'm the chairman of the Birkenhead Tr uh, Traders Association. Um, I've got two questions for you guys. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Question one. At a meeting on the 10th of August, Mr. Evans informed our community representatives that the decision had been made to scrap plans for the temporary market, that our community would remain in the current 
market site and furthermore no de demolition sl slash redevelopment work will be commenced anywhere on the current market site. When does Riddle Buddha Council expect the demolition or reconst reconstruction to begin? Okay, thank you for your thank you for your question, David. I can answer that. As discussed, as discussed with me as chair and a number of members of the Market Traders Committee on the 10th of September 2021, we are, as you know, revisiting our plans for a temporary market solution and responding to traders' feedback. We are now looking, we are now working towards having just one move to a permanent only offer. At this meeting, that's the meeting of the 10th of September, we discussed that we would not be able to share further details at that point, but would be in a stronger position in the following four to five weeks to outline the council position. We're still working to secure a permanent site option, so we are not yet able to update on when a move to a permanent market will take place or the subsequent date for demolition of the current market. That's the answer, David. Thank you. Okay, um, question two. Our community have been informed by a newsletter that the vacant Marks and Spencer site proposal has been revised and examined by Whittleborough Council officers and rejected as the proposal has been rejected. By officers, we do not see any information that can be classed as commercially sensitive. Therefore, will Willowbutter Council officers furnish our representatives with copies of all documents pertaining to the Marks and Spencer site held by Willowbutter Council without delay, please? Okay, thanks for, thanks for question too, David. The answer's quite straightforward, really. All information by the Council appertaining to the Marks and Spencers unit on Borough pavements is commercially sensitive and was provided by the owners of the shopping centre under the restrictions of a non-disclosure agreement. It's not possible for the Council to disclose any of this information. That's the answer. Thank you. I've just got one question to add to that one, the supplementary question. Um, can I ask, oh, David, sorry. can I ask, please, that any supplementary questions as per the governance arrangements for our committee, can I ask that any supplementary questions are submitted in writing, and I will personally instruct officers to respond to them in writing. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I've just been informed, I've just been informed that you are allowed to ask a supplementary question. It's got to, it's got to relate to the... It has to relate to the previous two questions, David. I do apologise for blindsiding you. It's regarding question two at the Martin Spencer's site. So it's currently we have a market manager who is going around T telling um, tenants that the, the Whittleborough Council will not support our move if we do decide to move to the Mark and Spencer site ourselves. Is this the, the point of the Whittleborough Council or is it um, Robert Langer's um, personal opinion? Okay, I've been advised on that particular issue. A written question will be provided later to the questioner. Where the reply cannot conveniently be given orally, so I don't know is the honest answer. In which circumstances councillor questioned, which is obviously me, will make arrangements for a written response to be provided to the questioner and circulated to all members within 10 working days thereafter. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for your time. Chair. You're very welcome. Thank you.
Chair. Councillor Burgess could I, could Joyce. I, can I ask you a question? Um, because obviously it's quite interesting that this has been brought up. Uh, sorry, David, I have to cut across you. We're not going to debate this. They, no, I'm not debating they, they it, were, I'm asking you a question. There were questions that have been asked. Yeah, no, I'm asking you a question. Feel free. It's, it's not a question I've had any notice of, David, so you may not be particularly well, you, you, satisfied. You obviously have legal counsel, so I'm sure he'll be able to answer it for you, Chair. The question is, will we be debating this separately at some point, given that it's clearly a contentious issue? Is it something that we as a group will be debating, or is it uh, a decision that's made um, under commercial sensitivity? My understanding of it is any subsequent decision about the market and associated issues around that will come back to this committee. That's my understanding of it, David. Thank you for your question. Chair, um, thanks. Could I also ask that, um, I very much welcome the Market Traders Association being here today, and that kind of consultation and dialogue uh, is important, and can ask that the future discussions do involve the market traders as well, because they will be directly affected by decisions of this committee. I think that's a very reasonable question, Councillor Bird, and I also think it's fair to say that there is ongoing dialogue. There has been a substantial amount of dialogue that's taken up a considerable amount of officer time and members' attendance at the market. So my understanding of that question is, yes, it is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing. We have listened to the market traders' representatives and will continue to do so until we find a suitable solution. Thank you for your question. Chair, I know you don't want to. It's me. Me, here. Here. Uh, Sorry, we're Councillor Hodgson. Sorry. Sorry. I know we're, we know we're, got, we're not going to discuss this, but I'd like to make an observation, especially for Councillor Bird, that there was a meeting planned for 3 o'clock this afternoon where certain councillors, i.e. yourself, myself, and Dave Mitchell, were prepared to go to the market and meet with the market uh, traders. But for, I wrote to them and said that we would meet today, but for some reason there was some confusion and they couldn't make it. So we're doing all our endeavours to meet up with them as we can, to talk to them and to discuss matters with them. Okay. Thanks for that contribution, Councillor Hodson. That brings us to item 5.2 on the agenda statements and petitions. There is one representation to be made by Roger Lee in respect of the Dominic House report. Can I just say, Mr Lee, that your representation should not exceed three minutes. Thanks, Mr Lee. If you'd like to step forward and use a microphone, please. Chair, just before we start, would it help if I introduce the item? as an agenda item or? Sorry, I didn't hear that, David. I just said, I just said it's an, it, it is an item on the agenda. Do you want me to introduce it before Mr Lee speaks or just allow him to speak? Or? No, I think it, it would probably be uh, relevant if the item was introduced okay. after Mr Lee's presentation, David, and then as per my request to the committee regarding <coughs> the debate, after your introduction, we can then go into the, the debate on that agenda item. If, if you're content with that, David. Yeah, I'm just looking to, to legal to make sure that's okay. Yeah. If the chair was going to ask for my advice, I, I would have phrased it exactly as the chair stated. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is one of three asset reports that I'll introduce tonight. This one is about a building... No, called... David, can I stop you? Yeah. We, we'll have the introduction to the item after the presentation oh, okay. by Mr right. Lee, if that's okay. Mr Lee, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to address the committee on this matter. My name is Roger Lee. I'm a chartered town planning consultant and I've acted as a consultant on behalf of Prospect Estates Limited for a number of years on a range of development projects, including outline, full applications, planning appeals and prior approval applications. So I submitted the prior approval applications on Prospect's behalf for the change of use of Dominic House to residential units comprising of three separate applications, one for 45 units, one for 50, and one for 70, all of which were approved by the Council last year. 
The reason for the variation in unit numbers and the number of applications was to give maximum flexibility relating to what the ultimate demand may be for occupation of the building. As a starting point to demonstrate the compatibility of prospects proposals with the aspirations of the Council, Dominic House is included in the draft master plan for refurbishment and redevelopment to bring it back into an active use with the primary aim for it to be a residential use, although the master plan advises of a preference for a more interactive use of the ground floor rather than wholesale residential, which is what the current plan and approvals are for. Prospect estates are agreeable to a non-residential use of the ground floor and last year entered into discussions with the citizens of Vice Bureau who had expressed an interest in occupying that, uh, that ground floor uh, level of the building. Unfortunately, due to the ongoing delays with reaching an agreement with the Council, uh, the Bureau have now secured alternative premises as far as, we're, uh, as far as we understand. So Prospect and the Council have been in discussions over the freehold of the building since May last year, and until the turn of the year, those discussions were progressing positively with an understanding that the Council wished to progress with an agreement with the company without delay. Unfortunately, that position has subsequently changed. The Council now uh, appears to wish to take a considerably longer period of time to explore its options, and this is linked to the unknown future at this stage of the Cherry Tree Shopping Centre. With respect, though, Prospect's proposals align with those in the draft master plan and there is no need, in our view, to delay the negotiations on the freehold interest as the current position with Dominic House does not have any negative effect on the overall long-term aspirations for Liscard. Prospect Estates are a long-standing, experienced company, uh, pro property and development company. They've carried out a number of similar developments to the one proposed at Dominic House in recent years in the north of the country, in Accrington, Stockport, Bolton, Barnsley and in Sunderland, of which I've represented them on, on all of those, building out residential conversions and securing much needed high quality residential occupation for people living in those areas. This is its simple aspiration for Dominic House and I would urge you to support the company's proposals to acquire the freehold interest and bring this building forward for development which will have a considerable and positive impact in terms of the regeneration of the centre. Just as a final note, um, there was a fire in the building on Monday evening uh, this, this week, so it is vulnerable at the moment as an empty, uh, empty premises, and even though it has been made secure, I think this just lends more support to the need to get an active use into the building. And if I can, I'll just read out very quickly some comments from the, fire, the attending fire officer who, who said in his email to the council, the fire has been deliberately started on the ground floor. It wasn't large. It was extinguished well before it was able to spread. However, I'm sure it goes without saying that fires of this nature can be extremely serious in multi-storey buildings. Fortunately, we were alerted quickly and our crews were able to act. A well-developed fire in this building would have a serious impact on our resources and those of the police and the council. There have been reports from local businesses, including Wilco's, which back onto the site, abuse breaking into the premises, and they have arranged to meet the police to pass CCTV. I just wanted to emphasize that and the serious, uh, potential serious implications for the future of the building. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lee, I'm perfectly timed. Thank you. Thank you for your representation. I'm sure that your comments will be taken into account by members during their consideration of the Dominic House report. David, would you like to now introduce that report, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. This report is a bit unusual in that it's bringing, it is initially bringing just the information to you to note there are, there are resolutions, there are options and decisions you could take. One reason for <coughs> putting this on the agenda was precisely so that Prospect Estates and Mr. Lee as their planning consultant could come and address you because it is right to say they've been seeking to buy the freehold. We don't own the building, we own the freehold for some time and it's fair to say we've been very cautious about that and they are frustrated about that and I fully understand why that is. For those of you who don't know, Dominic House is a five-storey block in Liscard. It, it's, um, it was built in the 70s. For many, many, many years it, um, it had a blue chip client who is the kind of client that people want, which is that it had the job centre in there, so a government department, regular income, 
very steady. In 2018, the, the, the job centre moved out, so it went from having a blue chip steady client to having no client at all. It has no future as an office block because of its nature and its age. It isn't, it isn't modern, anywhere near modern office accommodation. Um, at the time, we then began to negotiate with the previous leaseholders, and we did um, work through them with a the scheme, and we did try and involve them with local registered providers, and in fact, we made progress, and under the previous cabinet system, we did agree to sell uh, the freehold to that company for £230,000. So, so on the face of it, this is a, this is a really logical uh, um, proposal. It's a brownfield site use, which we fully signed up to as a council. It reuses the ex existing building, which is carbon friendly, etc. Uh, the pro prospect estates know that we agreed the sale previously. Um, it brings a capital receipt into the council, which is, which is much needed at the moment. It's central to amenities, given its location. And as we've heard, it's empty and deteriorating. And, and, and it's, it's, it's into a spiral now that we see with buildings that we own when they're empty for a while. There's this spiral of decline and people forcing their way in and, and using them for other purposes. And, and as Mr. Lee said, because it's a five-story building, it was only a very small fire on Monday, but it warranted a four fire engine response and a hydraulic tower simply because of the size of the building. So it is sitting there. So with all those things, what, why would we be cautious about it? And that's probably why we need your advice and steer, really. Um, we've, we've been nervous about it because the planning approvals range from 45 to 70 units, and clearly the building is of a fixed size. And if you put 45 units in, you do create a different kind of residential community to 70. So we've been, we've been a little nervous about that. As, as has been referenced, there's a Liscard master plan being produced and we've got real hopes of being able to really revitalize the area, repurpose some of the property, reconfigure the traffic distribution around the area and so on. And there's a nervousness that this building could be converted and would still retain its original appearance in an area that would change around it. Um, and, and as I say, there's the issue about about fitting in with the master plan, and also um, concerns, if you like, about knowing more about how the building will be managed. Now, they're, they're all things that we can't direct and make anybody do as the, as, as, as the freeholder, but the reason, the reason we brought it to you is that it may be that we've been overcautious or it may be that we're being um, uh, too anxious about those things and how our fears could be allayed. And that was why I wanted to put this on the agenda and I wanted the company, the director of the company is here and, and the planning consultant, I wanted them to come along and put their case to you, really, and then we can take it from there. So you can note this report, you can agree for us to dispose the freehold to this company as we did with the other one and that would go to P&R or you can give us some other direction on this. So we'd welcome your, your, your views on it, really. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Uh, before I open it up, can I just remind members that the recommendation is that it's recommended that the Economic Regeneration and Development Committee notes the current position. That's what the recommendation is. Do any members have any contributions, comments or observations that they wish to make? Councillor Bird. Thanks, Chair, and thank you very much for, for coming here. Um, the, can I, just, just questions for information, really. Um, your company is, is solely for profit and based outside of the Wirral, is it? Uh, can I, be, before you answer that question, can I, can I just stop you there? We didn't actually seek your permission as an organisation to take questions. I okay. thought the question was going to be asked of officers, Councillor Bird. Oh, sorry. I, I do apologise. Yes, I am sorry. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to take advantage of the fact that you're here in person and ask some straightforward questions. In, in light of, um, the, the, and you don't have to answer, that, that, that's your decision, I guess. Um, it's it's about, about community wealth building and the Rural Council has a policy to support locally owned and independent businesses and to create local jobs and the, the Dominic House site is very important to Liscard it's it's a key part of the master plan for the area and there's a uh, local community groups the um, that that have expressed views about their wishes for the building including um, social housing a community hub for the area that kind of thing and I was wondering if it's possible I'm sorry to Joe I will have to stop you that sounded terribly like a question to me. 
We haven't actually asked okay. as a committee for permission to ask questions. It's not in the report that there will be questions asked. It is within order for us as a committee to debate it based on the representation that we've heard, but I don't think it's in order for us to ask questions. Does any member have any observations or comments on the basis of the representation that we've heard or any observations or comments based on the content of the report? Hey, Chair. Councillor it, it, Burgess, Judge. I, I, I don't personally have a, a, a comment uh, on this, but would it help Councillor Bird if she made a comment about what she wanted to ask as a question? Would, would you mind very much resuming your seat, please, sir, uh, if, if you don't mind? Councillor Bird, if you could make a statement as opposed to yeah. uh, asking a question, sure. sorry. that would be extremely helpful. <laughs> Thank okay, you. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't understand the, the etiquette of the procedures now. I thought you were invited contributions, um, which is fine, of all kinds. And I'm sorry if any offence taken or people put in a difficult position. That wasn't my intention. Can I, can I, can I just finish off by saying, should you wish to ask a question, it's perfectly within the protocols to ask a question of the presenting officer. Thank That's you. perfectly acceptable. Okay. Thank you. So, so I, I am aware that um, the, the local residents action group have uh, various wishes for Liscard and Dominic House, including um, a community hub um, social and genuinely affordable housing, um, you, facilities for young people, etc. And I'm, so that's a, my statement. A question, if it can be answered, is how has that been taken into account in the, the current um, processes and aspirations for the properties and the area? Thanks. David, if you can, are you able to take that question? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I can also answer. Um, that, that um, Prospect Estates is not a company based on the will, but it actually has other property interests on the will. It has in particular taken over a large um, heavy industrial unit down in Birkenhead and, and put it into compartments for businesses and it's actually a thriving um, project for the area. So they do have other interests in the area. Um, in terms of the building, it is important to stress we don't own the building, we only own the freehold. So we've negotiated, we negotiated with the previous leaseholder and we're trying to work through negotiations with Prospect, but it is, it is, it is their building. Um, the, the idea of ground floor use has carried through from the original leaseholder proposals through into these proposals. Um, I think, I think I, I'm given to understand that ground floor residential doesn't work as well as when you're a bit higher off the ground in, in one of these former blocks, and I can understand that. And, and I think Prospect have indicated that they're, they're sympathetic to the ground floor being developed in, in that way. And in the, in the proposal with the previous leaseholder, there was an element of community use uh, planned on the ground floor. Um, I can also confirm that the, the projects Mr Lee referred to, Prospect have developed those in other areas and um, we have researched those only through, through, through obviously web-based materials which have been conversions of similar, similar blocks. Thank you. Thank you, David. That, that's really helpful. Does that content you, Councillor Bird? Yeah? Okay, that's smashing. Do we have any other comments or observations? Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Chair, uh, while we've got you, David. So where does the £230,000 come from as a number? That's, um, as I understand it, that's the, that's the figure that was negotiated with the previous leaseholder, and it's the figure that's currently on the table now. I'd have to, if the, I'd have to get you the back figure for, for work for it. I haven't got that with me, but it was worked out by the property valuation professionals. Thank you, David. Okay with that, Councillor Gardner, yeah? Uh, well, broadly, Chair, um, I'd like to see some numbers as how we get to this, and if it was with the previous leaseholder, that was when? That's several years ago. Prices change, markets change. We, you know, I'd like to, personally, I'd like to see an updated version to check that we are getting um, value for money for uh, the good taxpayers of Wirral and the residents of Wirral. Can I suggest, given that comment then, that 
outside the body of this meeting, we make arrangements for that information to be provided to you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Thank you, David. Any other comments or observations before we move to the recommendation? No, I'll read the recommendation again. It is recommended that the Economic Regeneration and Development Committee notes the current position. Are we happy to do that? Can I have a proposer? Councillor Burgess Joyce. Seconder? Councillor Mitchell. Okay, thank you. Can I thank you, gentlemen, for your representation? And on behalf of the committee, can I wish you a safe journey home? Thank you. Sorry, we did have a proposal in second that I should have actually said is that by assent, everyone content. Yeah? Yeah? Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the next item, the next regular item on our agenda, and that's item six, livable neighbourhoods, pages five to 110. And can I ask Alan Evans or Sally, whoever's taken the, taken the lead, to actually open and talk to the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report, as the Chair says, is on livable neighbourhoods. And um, the report actually starts with a definition of the objectives of livable neighbourhoods, which I thought would be worth just repeating. And that's namely that this is an area of low traffic use where people are encouraged to use more, take more journeys on foot or by cycle or other active travel modes, and where problems such as rat running are removed. So this report seeks approval for officers to work with Sustrans, um, a national charitable organisation, and the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, together with residents, schools and businesses within the Bebbington area, to co-develop and design a livable neighbourhood and to produce a business case which could be used to secure funding to um, come forward with any infrastructure that was proposed through that process. Um, the proposed area was chosen on the basis of a number of criteria, and this included local information highlighted in previous years by members, residents, schools, and local stakeholders, together with data around the number of schools in the area, the population density, and node, known road-related um, issues. The report outlines that um, this is an early phase of work for Sustrans, and that they would be working with local stakeholders to co-develop a proposal which would then potentially give rise to some, some, um, some trialling of some of the, the proposals, but would not be um, an, coming forward with any particular infrastructure proposals because that would be the subject of an infrastructure bid that would need to come back to members and also be made to, to provide the funding. So the report sets out, sets out that um, Sustrans have received funding from the Freshfield Foundation for this first phase of work from the city region. Um, it also refers to the fact that Wirral has worked previously with Sustrans on the Bike Life Report, which was um, an attitudinal assessment of cycling in 2010. The report sets out examples of the types of measures that the could be looked at, such as uh, footpath and lighting improvements, widening of junctions, uh, cycle paths, greening, and following a meeting with local ward members, um, this was also widened to include making provision for running. So the development of um, school neighbourhoods will be the initial driver to the project, and the report sets out the further five phases of the work that would be undertaken should members agree to progress with this proposal. And that's set out in section three of the report. There is no direct cost to the Council for Sustrans to undertake the community engagement, co-development and design of the Liverpool Neighbourhood Programme or for the production of the business case. However, the, there is no funding available in this proposal for the delivery of any permanent infrastructure. So any further funding applications <coughs> to implement a scheme would be subject to a separate report to, to members. 
Um, the team, the Sustrans team, would work very closely with um, colleagues in regeneration, but also with highways. Um, and these colleagues have already been fully involved in the discussions to date. So that's a, a sort of a summary of the report and sort of leads to the three recommendations that are within the report, um, which, and I, would you like me to read them out, Chair? Or? Thank you, Sally. I'm quite happy to read out right. the, the recommendations. Recommendation one, authorise the Director of Regeneration in place in consultation with the Director of Neighbourhood Services to work with Sustrans and local stakeholders, including schools, and residents to co-develop and design a livable neighbourhood, incorporating a school neighbourhood cluster in Bebbington and to produce a business case which could be used to secure funding. That's the first recommendation. Number two in your papers, authorise the Director of Regeneration in place in consultation with the Director of Neighbourhood Services, Chair and Spokes of Economy Regeneration and Development Committee and the Environment, Transport and Climate Committee to implement any temporary test stroke trial schemes which arise from the stakeholder co-development programme and note that a further report will be brought forward to members for approval of the business case. The submission of any funding application and installation of any permanent livable neighbourhoods infrastructure. Councillor Mitchell, do you have a comment or observation? Just a, a, an observation more than anything else. Looking at the list of schools in Bevington that are named, one of the infant junior schools that I went to is there, but not the other one. Mill Lane, why is that not on as part of the, the school catchments? Is it too high up by Stoughton Woods? Because there's Bevington High, there's Willow Grammar School for girls, Willow Grammar School for boys, there's Town Lane, St Andrews, there's quite a few others, but Mill Lane, High Bevington, is not part of the school catchment. Just wondered why. Thanks, uh, Councillor Mitchell. Sally, yeah, can Councillor you Mitchell, take that, please? Um, I'm certainly not sure of the exact reason why certain the, the school wasn't included. I'm very happy, though, to make representation that it, you know, that the that it should obviously include the cat because there is a wider catchment area, and that the boundary be considered on that basis. So happy to come back to you to confirm that um, after I've raised that with the officers concerned. Thanks, Ca Councillor Mitchell. Any other comments or observations, Councillor Cleaves? Sorry. Um, yeah, so just quickly, um, um, it's great that the Liverpool Neighbourhood Strategy is being um, developed in Bebbington and it's the right thing to do as the Council's goals towards becoming carbon neutral. My question is that Burke and Head came out equal in points to Bebbington. I'm just wondering, will these strategies be implemented as part of the regeneration moving forward? Sally, can you take that? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, certainly. And that was part of the, the decisions that was, was informed the, the criteria, was the fact that there is so much activity taking place in Birkenhead that it's important that this is embedded in what the work that we're doing in Birkenhead. So that, this, you're, you're quite right. This will be part of the process that we, we implement as we move forward with the regeneration proposals. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more observations or comments, can I ask if we agree by assent with the proposer and seconder the three recommendations that I've read out? Can I have a proposer and seconder? Councillor Burgess Joyce, you're happy to propose. Thank you. Seconder. Councillor Tony Smith, thank you. Everyone content and happy with that? Yes. No abstentions? No? Excellent. Thank you very much. That brings us on to item seven. Mass transit. 
pages 111 to 132 in your report. And can I ask Alan Evans or Sally Shah, whoever's going to speak to it, to open the report, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report provides members with an update regarding the business case development which has been undertaken to date for the delivery of a mass transit system in Wirral and it seeks approval for the Wirral Waters Mass Transit Phase A within Wirral Waters to be included in the city region's submission to government in October this year as part of the bus service improvement plan. So the report also defines um, what mass transit is. It talks about the fact that it's a high quality public transport system that can move a lot of people on a regular and frequent basis. And it's also likely to have clear band branding to make, make it recognizable. Um, linked to that, you might ask why are we bringing this forward? And it's because proposals for a mass transit system linking rural waters to the town center and to our existing transport network have been identified as an integral part of the infrastructure discussions to support the rural waters development. As ensuring that the residents and workers within the new housing and commercial developments are not reliant on cars but have access to good quality public transport is essential both in terms of making the area an attractive place to live, an attractive place for people to want to come and work, but also in delivering our ch climate change objectives. It's also part of a package that will attract residents to the area. Work has therefore taken place to develop a business case or a delivery plan for a mass transit scheme based on a phased approach which reflects the development timeframes within Wirral Waters and provides that last mile connectivity to our existing networks. It should also be noted that in parallel with the mass transit business case development, an active travel strategy is also underway which has identified and made suggestions to address shortfalls in active travel within this area. To progress the work, we have set up a project team and we have appointed consultants to develop this phased approach, with phase A being developed to meet the needs of the occupants of the legacy development in autumn 2023. An important point to note, however, is that as part of the options appraisal work, the identification of the phase A mode would not prejudice the mode for the ultimate scheme. The report sets out that the work has been done to develop the business case. It sets out the work that's been done around the objectives, the funding of finance study, the demand study, and the mode appraisal. It identifies that there will be demand from new left bank developments as they come forward, and this supports the incremental approach that is proposed by this report. So phase A is to be a new high quality tram-like bus-based vehicle to meet the time scales for the developments, but also the funding opportunities that we have through the Bus Back Better scheme. This does not preclude, however, a final network being a track-based system. This report sets out the details of the proposals for this first phase around the fact that it is, um, and it refers, I think, in one of the appendices to the fact that we're looking at a vehicle that could be similar to what's seen as the currently known as the Belfast Glider, but it would also incorporate the latest hydrogen technology um, and obviously that, that is being currently procured by Mersey Travel um, as a zero emission solution. The key concept of Phase A is to provide this type of low carbon vehicle that looks and feels as high quality as a tram, which will be easily recognised through branding and it will have the infrastructure in place to serve the new users effectively. Returning to the funding, the Bus Back Better report was published by the Department for Transport in March 2021. Um, and this is the new long-term strategy for buses. And within that, there is a three billion funding commitment for investment in schemes. There is an opportunity, therefore, for this phase A Wirral Waters uh, mass transit system to be included in that combined authority bus service improvement plan and to be foot put forward for securing funding from that scheme. The combined authority have confirmed that the proposals that we've developed, the business case that's development fits the criteria for this funding and we believe we have a, a good opportunity of securing it. 
if we're able to take that phased approach, it means that we would have a mass transit system in place in order for the new developments at North Bank when they open for residents to be able to use that from the beginning of their occupation. So this leads back to the um, two recommendations at the start of the report, Chair. Thanks, Sally. Can I invite comments, observations, questions? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Mrs. Shah. Um, F forgive me for so probably labouring a point. Um, wh when I first was aware of the gliders, um, I, I confess I tittered because I, I was aware of them in, uh, in Ireland. And I suppose my question really is that they look great, but they are just a bus. Um, in, in, in the great scheme of things, they're a bus. They're not a tram. And how much additional cost is there involved in a, a, a sort of per head similar ordinary bus a non-hydrogen bus. Um, th these are clearly going to be quite expensive. They haven't been taken up across the UK. One wonders potentially why. And are we aware of what potential maintenance costs there are going forward? Um, because they're not just an ordinary bus that can go into the depot. They do require additional uh, requirements. Th thank you, Mrs. Shah. Thank you, Chair. Um, just if I, if I may, Chair, to yeah, um, respond to your points. Um, Councillor, the, in terms of the work that we've done around the glider, yes, they may look, you're, you're right, they are a bus. However, there are a number of features of this that make them very different to a bus. First of all, that the proposal would be for a much more frequent service, and one that has, is very clearly branded and very clearly seen as something that is more attractive to use. And this is something that's been, we've been in conversation with the um, people at Belfast who have introduced this, where it has actually been successful and it has attracted users to the service that would not have, hadn't been attracted to the previous bus route. Um, it's also the advantage of it is although you are obviously investing in the buses, you, these, because it's flexible, should we, as we progress forward with the, the work that we need to do to implement the final um, the sort of proposals around what the mass transit s s solution could be, because it's, it can be transferred, we, even if we went for a track-based system, that we wouldn't be wasting that investment because we'd be able to move that to other parts of the network so it would be, continue to have a, have a life. The other feature of the scheme is that it's not just about the, the bus itself, it's also about the, the stops, because the idea is that they would have far more tram-like stops, which would be elevated. They would also provide an opportunity for there to be uh, cross-modal integration. It sounds a bit of a jargon phrase, but it's, that's where we would have perhaps e-bicycles for hire, there would be the opportunity for the, the cycle lanes to come in. It would be far more, um, I think if you sort of see the tram stops in Manchester, it would be far more where you'd have integrated ticketing potentially and you'd have the opportunity for real-time information to be shown. So it's for, although it is a bus, it doesn't look like a bus and it's certainly the, all of the, the, I suppose, the, the support infrastructure is very different as well. In terms of the, um, the maintenance, I can't answer the detail of that question. However, I'm happy to, to come back to you with that information. But I suppose it's also perhaps to point out that we as a council wouldn't be operate. The intention is not for the council to operate this. We, that's why in terms of the project team that we've got, Mersey Travel as part of the combined authority are fully embedded in the, the work that we're doing because clearly we would expect the system to be adopted as part of the wider network that we've already got and be operated by operators as part of the, the Mersey Travel Network. But I'm happy to come back to you with, uh, on that, that detail. Thank you, Mrs. Shaw. Um, David, before, thank you, Chair. Sorry. Be before we move on, Alan, you have a contribution. Thank you, Chair. Um, David, and, and I know you'll know this, but just to I think it's worth pointing out as well, is um, one of the challenges we've got around building these new communities, so you know, new homes going into rural waters, new businesses, is <coughs> attracting um, end occupiers as well, so both on a commercial and a residential basis. So um, as we are at the moment, we, have, we haven't got the answers to some of those questions. How do you get to these places? How do you travel to other destinations? How do they link to the la already reliable Mersey Rail service? So it's that last mile of connectivity. 
So it, you know, it, it is part of that offer really, and having something that's bespoke to the area and branded to the area just starts to make it feel and um, and, and, and you know, hopefully it will become a, a new community neighbourhood that you know relies on some of that connectivity, rather than um, if there is a bus and you, you choose not to, then you might just default to the car. So you know, it, it, I, I think there is that change in perceptions, changing people's behaviours. You know, there's, there's a lot that uh, go alongside with the, the the brand of the bus in particular, and and also that modal shift that Sally talked about. So I know you know probably some of that, but it's worth coming in. Um, f forgive me, Chair. J just two By seconds. Means, two David. seconds. Um, no, you, you, you haven't convinced me. I, I'm awfully sorry. Um, I, I want to be convinced, but I, I have to be honest. I, I, I know you, you don't know a lot of the answers, um, but I'm not convinced that it's not just a bus, and why don't we just have a bus? And I understand running it twice as frequently, but you can run a bus twice as frequently. I, 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 forgive me, Mrs. Shaw, Mr. Evans, I'm not convinced that this sounds like it is a viable proposal. It may, it may, it may look good on paper, forgive me, but I, I'm not convinced that the costs will be brought back in. I just, I just can't, and, and you're not convincing me, I'm awfully sorry, that this is not just a bus with very low body. Um, and I do know what they look like, and I've traveled on them, um, and they are very nice, but they're just a bus, sorry. Alan, you want to come back? Thanks, Chair. Um, I, can, can I make a suggestion as well, then? So I think this evening what we're asking for is the permission to progress the, the business case. So, you know, it's, it's to take it forward. But I'd like the opportunity, if, if this helps, is to run a workshop for members as well and to bring colleagues from Mersey Travel and, and some of those specialist teams. Because I, I, I think it's, it, we're unable to, in, in just a report to committee members, Perhaps go through some of that detail which which you're looking for there, Council Burgess Joyce. So if that's a suggestion, uh, and, and, and the, the rationale behind it, Chair. So forgive me for hogging this. Is I also sit on the Liverpool City Region um, committees as well, and <coughs> with the greatest respect, I didn't really get the answer I felt I would have got there either. So something's not. It, it's just not there. So I, I do actually appreciate uh, Mr. Evans that that offer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. No problems, David. Before I move on to you, Dave. You're happy with the opportunity for us to, as a committee, have a workshop and discuss further some of the elements around this provision? Yep, quite content. Good. Councillor Mitchell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, I'll take everybody back to 2000 when this development was pre first proposed. Now, Peel themselves, they spent an awful lot of money with McDonald and the local authority in designing traffic routes for a tram system to connect to all the stations relevant to uh, that was required, Hamilton Square, Birkenhead Park, you know, yes, all the rest, Bidston. So they were already designed and already part and parcel of a plan that was approved by this council. And I understand the reasons behind wanting to progress and move things on. Are Peel happy with the way these uh, actions are taking place against their original plans? As I was under the impression that when it was agreed by the council that that was something that was foremost in uh, our beliefs, which was the best way moving forward for rapid transport within that whole development of Royal Waters. Alan, would you like to take oh, that? And as a side, at that time I was on Mersey Travel as well. So issues were looked into on the wider uh, so that you could actually have connectivity from Hamilton Square to New Brighton. The one piece in the link that's missing. Thanks for that, Councillor Mitchell. That's, that's an interesting question. Alan, would you like to take that, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll answer if, if that's okay. Councillor Mitchell and Sally may want to come in and supplement that. So, um, one of the, the, the challenges we've got in um, a fixed track solution is just the rollout. So, a transport, transport works order would take a significant amount of time. So, to actually push that through now, take that through the relevant planning and legislative processes, we're into the future. 
one of the, the challenges we've had as a council is when was Wirral Waters going to start? So if we'd have done this infrastructure five years ago, it would have been finished and sort of running without the, the end use. So we, we really are, to a certain extent, just making sure that we're maximising the public investment going in. And that's why the, the proposal to bring it forward, this first phase to cover um, the new homes and new uh, um, offices coming on stream uh, in that short term. But, and as uh, Sally said, there's a, you know, the opportunity as a subsequent phase to look at that track solution or that, that more permanent solution which was originally envisaged as part of the master plan. Um, one of the things we've had to take into account as well, and we, we are in um, really um, regular dialogue appeal over this, um, perhaps they would want to get that more fixed term solution out as a, as a, as a f in the first instance and one of the challenges we've got is just making sure that we um, Public, put the public investment into the right place, not just from a capital perspective, but as Sally said, this will be run by the, um, as, as part of the Mersey travel network as well. So obviously the operational costs of that are something we're taking into account. So with all of that in mind, that was the, the first phase rollout with, a, with a, the secondary phase, um, which will follow. So hopefully that answers your question. Sure, Sally, if you want to come in. I think it is. It's, it's very much not. I think the, the first phase, the um, the brief to develop this first phase was very much on the basis that it should not compromise what could be a tram system for the longer term. It's absolutely essential that that doesn't happen. And but the the driver for this first phase is very much linked to the fact that if you we are building the with Peel the apartments at. Legacy. We have the urban splash houses coming on. We have the Hyde office about to open. If people start visiting and living in those those uh, that accommodation, feeling that they have to have a car, that it, all the evidence and the studies show that it's very difficult to get them to move to a public transport system after that. And we just felt that it was absolutely critical that we had that offer for our climate change sort of ambitions, as well as, as Alan said earlier, our investment ambitions to actually attract people to that, that we had that in um, as a possibility. I think, just going back to the, 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 the request, it's very much to be able to put a mark, what we're asking as a committee is that whether we can put a marker down for this, for this uh, project to be included in this application to, for funding. It is, there would be, it's very much an expression of interest, there would need to be that full business case development and I think the report says that we would be expected to come back to committee with that business case development. So if you were able to approve it, we would be able to organise the workshop so, and say bring Mercy Travel colleagues with us. That would, you would then have an understanding and we'd be able to answer questions and deal with obviously put the, the queries that you have around the, the costs as part of that business case development process and then you would again we wouldn't be submitting it unless you agreed the, the, the business case. Thanks, Sally. Councillor Cleves, you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, obviously, the environment is quite important moving forward for World Council. So, vehicle tyres are the largest source of microplastics. So, by investing in more buses, putting more tyres on the road, that's adding to the, the problem we have and we are surrounded by water, so we're adding to more microplastics, which is the biggest source in our oceans, to, for a temporary solution. So more tyres on road for a temporary solution to then replace that in the future with trams. Why can you not just use the buses you've got at the moment and then spend that money and get the tram system put in place a bit quicker? I just think it's a little bit of a waste of a, a gap in between. It, it, it's not good for the environment. It's a waste of money. And... It, 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 essentially, if it is a bus, it, why can't you just use them in the meantime and get the tram system in place a lot quicker? I don't understand. Who'd like to take that? Sal? Sure, fine. Let me start. Um, thank you, Councillor Gleaves. Yes, um, clearly, if we were able to, to move swiftly, the, 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 you know, the quicker the better to get to that final state. However, we aren't able to implement that as I think... Um, Alan went through, there are a number of, of hoops that we need to jump through, not least of it being the development of that business case, which is, and there's a bit of a chicken and egg here, because it also, it has to be based on the future demand. So in terms of that track-based system, we have to be able to show that the development that's coming, coming forward, and we need to develop that business case. Now, we are moving, because we're doing this in parallel. We haven't stopped. We're absolutely carrying on with that. So we're doing that as quickly as possible. But we're also, I suppose, the other um, 
part of the, the, I suppose the risk approach that we took with this was to consider that if we didn't increase the, the, the amount of public transport that was available in the area, that there would be pri more private cars. So in terms of the risk of the, you know, from the, as you say, from the, the wheels, though, that would be increased by the environmental sort of detrimental aspects of more private cars being on the road. Plus the fact we have, however, looked at, um, there, we understand there are numerous projects underway at the moment looking at how to reduce emissions from tyres, and we'd be very much keeping that in mind. Uh, we understand that there's one that the, I think it's the James Dyson Foundation claims that they can reduce by 60%. It's still very early days, but we're very much keeping abreast of that. So if by the time we've been able to get, you know, that that works accelerated, we would certainly be taking advantage of that in terms of the types of tyres that we would be wanting to put on these vehicles. It is purely the fact that in terms of we feel that this is still, in environmental terms, this is better than having an increase in, in the private cars that would otherwise be the case. Can I make a comment, please, given that we are looking at a workshop as part of our recommendations? Uh, I'm a little perplexed. Uh, I thought the Belfast gliders were hydrogen driven buses, albeit with tyres, um, but to actually introduce some sort of infrastructure using current buses whilst we look at a tracked solution would seem to be counterproductive in terms of pollution. Uh, so uh, perhaps that's something that we can kick about at the workshop. Uh, and actually get some definitive figures around that in terms of pollution from a Belfast glider as opposed to an established bus that perhaps fueled by diesel. Uh, I'd just like to throw that into the mix as well. Uh, can I ask, are there any more observations or comments before we move to the recommendations on this? Councillor Gardner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do take on board that this is phase A of an iterative process. I do get that, but I do agree with, with David that it does seem like buses to me, really. And I'm not sure the developments would increase car use that much because there's no parking with much of it. So if there's no parking, people, you, know, you can't have 3,000 cars parking up around you know, um, West Float Wallasey. Um, but more to the point, we are the regeneration committee, and we have to think of it in regeneration terms, not particularly transport terms, although that's important. And it is the case globally that trams create regeneration. They are the vehicle that create regeneration. And I'm a little bit disappointed, you know, when we, got, when we had the presentation um, last week, well, yeah, it's a bus, and, well, okay. I'm not really seeing the, the energy I don't think I've seen it once uh, on this committee that we're actually sort of aiming for a tram system. I hear sort of bits of words, we might have one one day, who knows what we might get one day. I want a tram system. We all need a tram system. And we need to be ambitious and state we're going to get a tram system. Thanks, Councillor Gardner. Can I just make another observation, please? I'm trying very hard not to lead, uh, but I do think it's very relevant and it's something else I'd like us to discuss in the workshop, and that's the costs associated with the track solution, as opposed to costs associated with the glider provider. Initially, I think everyone sat around this table has an aspiration for a track solution, but I think initially the costs could become prohibitive. So I'd like to put that on the table for the workshop as well, please. Can I actually ask now that we move on to the recommendations? And I would ask that we could perhaps <coughs> agree them by assent. Having said that, if people are not comfortable, I understand that we may need to go to a vote. Uh, but initially, I'd like to agree by assent, given our uh, workshop scenario. And we're, we are agreeing the two recommendations, noting the progress made in the development of the Willow Mass Transit business case to date. 
So there's been a lot of progress made in that and request a further report be brought forward to a future meeting of this committee. So it's, I think it's fair to say we, to some degree we're going to be the architects of our own future. And authorise the director of regeneration in place to work with the, and I was dreading saying all these letters, but I will, LCRCA to include mass, Whittle Mass Transit Network Phase A in Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Bus Service Improvement Plan submission to the Department for Transport in October 2021. Can I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Councillor Mitchell, you're proposing. Have a seconder. Councillor Smith, thank you. Can we do that by assent? Yes, agreed. Thank you, thank you members. That brings us on to item eight, property disposals, pages 133 to 144 in your report. And can I ask David Armstrong, who's been very patient, to actually open and speak to this report? Thank you, David. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, this is hopefully a straightforward report. It's three assets proposed for disposal that the Council doesn't require for its operational needs. Um, the, the report makes reference to the capital and asset group. That's a mechanism within the Council where any asset proposed for release is circulated around all of the Council and all the directorates and departments can come forward if they say they have another use for these properties and no one has in respect of any of these properties. Um, very briefly, it's a residential property in Balls Road, Oxton, which was previously used by our adult social care. It, um, the proposal there is to go to auction. It's an isolated property from the council's perspective. It needs work and we have no further use for it. So the proposal there is auction. Proposal two is Plymyard Cemetery Lodge. Um, it's a lovely little building tucked away just next to the A41. Ideal building if you like quiet neighbors because it's, you have to go through the cemetery to get to it. It was the lodge house for a much bigger house that was um, demolished. So it's actually a nice building, avenue of trees, a nice gateway. We have sold a number of these off in the past in various cemeteries, a, a Rake, Rake Lane and Flaybrick and one or two others. Um, and we would like to put that with an estate agent to begin with so that there's more chance of discussion between prospective buyers and, and ourselves through the estate agent because people need to understand that they are going to move into a house within a, a, a very special area that matters a lot to people. You have to drive through it to get to the house. And we found it's worked best in the past if we do that through an agent rather than auction. But the proposal is that we would go to auction if we, couldn't, uh, if we didn't get any interest through the estate agent route. But I, I hope we will. And the third building is a, is a former laser engineering centre, which is just behind Camel Laird's. Um, it was built as a, an apprenticeship building, was converted to a laser engineering centre for the university. They moved out some time ago. It's, it's, um, it's a non-standard building. It was obviously built for education as well as manufacturing, so it's a rather quirky building in terms of its internal layout. It was leased to a local company who do, um, they do, they do, they do lots of things, from manufacturing through to a lot of social value work, working with groups, um, Neo Cafe and one or two other groups, a group that help with bicycles. It's, they've got quite a varied um, offer and the proposal is to sell the freehold to them. We've had it independently valued as well as the council's internal valuer on the valuation. Um, and again, it's a building we have no further use for. Um, it, is, it is a quirky building and they've made good use of it. They've, it was, it was semi-derelict and they brought it back into use and put it to some good purpose. Um, so those are the three buildings, Chair, and that's the background. Happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Anyone have it? Councillor Mitchell. Uh, just one if I may, Chair, and it's in, in, in relation to the, to the Plymouth Cemetery. Is, is there any uh, movement on the redundant toilet block next door to it, which could cause problems? Through, through you, Chair. There isn't, actually. I did go and have a look at the building. I, looked, I go and look at all of the things that are coming here. And I did take a little walk along the lay-by, you're right, and that is there. And it has been boarded up for some time. I, I rather think we sold it, but I'm not sure. But I will look into that, because it's, it's not... I went to look to make sure it wasn't part of, the, of this building that's being released for sale, and it isn't. There's a small area of land around it, so I will take that away and pick up on that. If I may, Chair, uh, somebody wanted to buy that many years back. It's used as a cafe, but the council turned it down. 
I'll follow that up, but that's not included. As you say, it's quite close, but it's not included in this sale. This is the little lodge house that was obviously built at one time for the bigger house, little sandstone half timbered. Needs a lot of work, but it's a nice little property. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, David. Anyone, any further observations or comments before we move to the recommendations? No? Can we move to the recommendations then? The recommendations are, as per stipulated in your papers, there are five recommendations which we would need a proposer and second of four, and hopefully we can agree by assent. Anyone prepared to propose these recommendations? Councillor Smith? Anyone prepared to second them? Yes, Councillor Povel? Can we do it by assent? Yes? Thank you, members. That brings us to <clears throat> item 10. Having already dealt with item 9. Item 10 is the sale of land across Lane Wallasey and is pages 153 to 160 in your report. David, you're going to open the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is a proposal that came to the Council from the company. It's an interesting proposal that West Wallasey Van Hire occupy the land on the other side of Junction 1 to B&Q. It, 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 it was built as the Max Spielman building. Some of you will know it as that. That's their building and they occupy the land around it. They're a homegrown company built up from a, a family business, but it's a national business now. They lease um, pickups, vans and cars to national organisations and I believe they offer a next day service anywhere in the country. So they've built it into a very substantial business. It employs um, 200 and odd people, uh, plus the other people, other businesses that support it in the area. Um, the council has sold land to them previously around the building when they moved into Max Spielman. We sold them some land between there and the motorway about a decade ago. And they're seeking to buy another piece of land from the council in order to provide additional stabling area for vehicles. So these are vehicles. The vehicles come in on transporters, they're unloaded, they're prepared for contract, and at the end of the contract they come back there and presumably they get cleaned up and ready for disposal. So there's considerable in and out volumes of vehicles, but it's not, a <clears throat> it's not a yard like the council yard where vehicles come and go um, for the purposes which they're, they're normally used for. These are new vehicles coming in, then going out to companies, then coming back at the end of the lease. The company also has the original uh, accommodation, the original site in Wallasey Village. Um, they would like to buy a piece of land which was uh, some time ago a, school, a playing field, which has been out of use as a playing field for some times, but which does have designation as green space currently and which is indi indi indicated as green space in the current draft plans for going forward. So there's a balance here between that and the need of the company. Um, the scheme does include um, a number of um, climate relevant pro uh, elements in its project in terms of the surfacing, planting and also a new footpath through uh, around this area. It is tucked away, this, this piece of land, it's not readily accessible. We would need to renegotiate a contract with the Forestry Commission. We leased a lot of land to the Forestry Commission around that junction some years ago, which is all growing nicely now with trees. It was part of the tip restoration and we would need to just negotiate with the Forestry Commission to get an access to this piece of this piece of land. There's been a range of views expressed on this. Obviously the company would like it to go ahead. They've invested time and effort in developing the scheme. They would need to get planning permission. There are concerns expressed by others about the fact that this is currently a, a green space, albeit a, a pitch that hasn't been used for some time, and a piece of land with some quite considerable drainage issues. Um, so it, it, really is, it really is one with a wide range of views. Um, the company are keen to progress it. They do point out how they've grown and they point out how they've remained in their original location. They also point out there are issues with the transporters bringing vehicles in when they use the site in Wallasey Village because the transporters can't readily go under the bridge at the station. So there's some fairly convoluted loading and unloading goes on, some of which um, causes some real difficulties for neighbours if the drivers are, aren't particularly cooperative. Um, and it involves a lot of to in and fro in unloading, going under the bridge, coming around, putting the transporter up and so on. 
Um, the company assured us that it would alleviate some of those issues because they'd be able to use the main site more, the new site. And there's also a planning permission which recently elapsed for, a, for them to uh, create a new access direct into that site from the dual carriageway, which takes you away from the motorway as you swing around towards Wallasey Golf Club. Um, so it is it, a hopeful range of views. Um, they brought the scheme to us. They've worked it up into a scheme, and it's here for your consideration. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Comments, observations? Councillor Burgess, Joyce. Uh, thank you, David. Um, I suppose, I mean, I have, I have visited the site, and I know colleagues have as well. Um, I, I'd just sort of like it to be as a, as a point of note here, Chair, if, if we could uh, make sure that the purpose of the use of the land is as stated and that there is not likely to be any construction planned on that site, uh, any usage of that site other than for what it was originally intended. I mean, is there some way that the council is likely to put anything on it, a covenant that will stop it being used? I appreciate it's a bit of wetland. I accept that. It is quite damp. But I'm just very concerned that that potential land is being sold for what is a fairly low figure and yet potentially um, could be worth a lot uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burgess Judge. Before I come on to you, Andrew, uh, from what David's just said, it would require planning. So I think there's no reason, unless someone tells me different, an officer tells me different, there's no reason why that couldn't be planning condition and consideration. I, I, I accept that. I think what I'm looking for really is some reassurance uh, in this meeting really for any ideas as to, because I'm conscious that um, the Deputy Chief Executive has obviously sold um, the proposal well, but I'm just conscious that we need to know here that that's not going to fall into the hands of somebody other than the person who's buying it now. I think that's a fair question, David. Absolutely fair. And I, for one, wouldn't attempt to answer that. Uh, I'm sure we have expertise within the officer cadre who are more than capable of answering that. Would it, uh, would it be in order for you to actually receive a written reply to that question, David? Or do you want a verbal one now? Uh, whichever is easiest. I'm, I'm happy with the written reply, um, if that suits the spokes on, on our side. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, Councillor Burgess uh, Joyce has uh, raised an issue about. Uh, I'll start again. Councillor Burgess Joyce has raised an issue about whether some sort of controls could be put on the fu future use uh, of the land. Well, um, the issue is that the the agreed price has been based on a set of assumptions as to what covenants there will be imposed on the land, and if there are particularly rigorous uh, further controls required by this committee, then that would require a re-evaluation of, uh, of, of the consideration. So um, I, I'm concerned that um, if members um, were to, um, to agree this on the assumption that some sort of covenant could be imposed, um, then that's something which could cause some difficulty uh, uh, later on. So. Um, um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's my concern at the moment because there isn't actually, I'm not aware of any provision regarding that in terms of the, the head to terms. That would be an additional uh, provision which could affect the, uh, the agreed price. I think David okay. might Okay, given that situation then, uh, it would appear, before I ask Andrew to come in, it, it would appear that, that we're not content with that. One member's not content with it. Andrew, would you like to give your contribution? Just to build a few bricks on what David said, um, I think we in the Conservative group would oppose this idea because I've spoken with the local ward councillors in great depth who consulted with local residents over quite a long period of time. And um, they're worried about the prevention of the loss of the green space, albeit neglected to a large commercial car park because residents living next to the fields will be faced with a large car park occupied by vans and vehicles on lease. Cross Lane, which leads to a nature reserve, is too narrow for the volume of traffic 
and the junction with the Liso Road, and it also has a poor RTA record in the borough, actually worse than Spittle Crossroads, which we're all aware of. And the local plan team have assessed our request for this site to be designated as a local green space in the local plan and agree it meets the criteria. There is a report that you can see with regard to that. The site is part of the floodplain, so the neighbours are concerned that even if it's just tarmacked over as a car park, it will cause problems to the houses as to their presence, which they already suffer from flooding. And the company has suggested they would provide an all-weather pitch on Walacre playing fields to support the community. The briefing from the FA that, that has been shared suggests that the money for that will be available from elsewhere. And the company may suggest that giving this land a label to vacate the site on Liso Road. They've promised this before and they've never kept that agreement. Um, David mentioned before that... Uh, David Armstrong, that there are lots of traffic going in and out of that site. So there are concerns for the neighbours. So it's not just about traffic, it's about what's going to happen to the neighbours when it turns into a big car park. They're losing the green space at the rear of them. And uh, also there's the concerns about flooding. So there's quite a lot there for us, I think, to say at the moment. We're not happy to accept the proposal. And I don't think that uh, if we're banging on um, conditions, the price is obviously going to go up or down or whatever, down. And uh, we already think that £150,000 for a plot of land that size, considering what you could do with this in the future, is not, very, not, not a very good figure. So as I say, uh, we in the Conservative group will be uh, opposing that. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hodson. Councillor Claves. Has anyone looked in the implications this may have on other van hire businesses? So, obviously, you've mentioned that it's going to be great for this company. They can expand and they can grow. But there are other van hire businesses on the Wirral. And, obviously, because of COVID, businesses have been struggling. So, I just don't think that that would be fair, that that could potentially take away. It, the expansion of this could take away business from someone else. Has anyone explored that? Yeah. Alan? Thank you, Chair. Um, just in response to Councillor Gleave, um, so my knowledge of this company is that they operate on that, in, that national footprint. So a lot of the vehicles they have are then um, sent out to, to national destinations. So there isn't, obviously there is a bit of a local competition, but their business and their, um, their market is, is far more national than, than the other um, companies that we've got within the borough. So we have looked at that uh, previously when we've looked at supporting the company. So it, it is on that national footprint rather than a local footprint. Okay, folks, given there's no more questions or comments, uh, it appears to be a yes or no decision for us as a committee uh, to either proceed or not proceed. Uh, do we have any proposers or seconders to support the recommendations? Do we have any proposers or seconders against the recommendations? Councillor Hodson proposing. I, will, I, I propose that we refuse this application at this present time. Okay, thank you. That's seconded by Councillor Burgess Joyce. Okay, obviously that will go to a vote. All those in favour of that proposal which has been seconded by Councillor Burgess Joyce. Please show. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Um, so that's that's been approved. Yeah, the proposal has been approved. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Any abstentions? Oh, Can I do that again? Okay, we'll do it again for the sake of regularity. In order for our, uh, for our legal expert to conduct the count again, we had a proposer and a seconder that the proposal actually gets rejected. All those in favour of supporting the rejection, please show. By my reckoning, that's unanimous then. Thank you, members. 
This brings us on then to item 11. And can I thank Pete Molyneux for his patience this evening. Peter, can you open the report for item 11, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the financial monitoring report for the first quarter of the year, and that, that runs to the 30th of June. Um, this is the four elements in, in the report. There's, there's a revenue forecast, a capital forecast, uh, a note on reserves, and an update on, on savings. So if I quickly run through, through, the, through, through the report. Um, table one is a kind of high level analysis of, of, of the committee's revenue budget. Um, there's obviously a lot of cost centres and codes, but this is kind of summarised into quite, quite a, a high level. So you, you can see there that the budget is, is, is 3.6 million pounds, 3610. The forecast for the year is 3590. So there's a positive or favourable variance in total of 20,000 20, pounds for the year. Um, there's a number of sort of, of variations um, over the areas. Uh, there's positive variations within the regeneration area, mainly down to kind of staffing, staffing vacancies, uh, which will be filled, but gives kind of a windfall, etc. There's a couple of, of, of adverse variances. One is on planning and building control, and that is some external fees, which which, um, which come from outside of us, outside of environment advisory service. You, you provide statutory advice on archaeology, uh, ecology work, etc. So some of the fees are higher than than anticipated. So that's kind of an adverse variance. Um, and then just some minor variances. So, in terms of revenue, say it's £20,000 positive okay, in that table. And there's a bit of explanation that follows, follows down. Okay. Um, table two just has the same kind of information, but just, just split over types of, uh, types of, of spend. So, £20,000 is just analysed over pay, non pay, etc., which I've just explained there. Table three, then it's just got a list of kind of the, the budget savings for the for the directorate. Um, three of them are on green, um, and the fourth one is amber, which is the World Growth Company income. We think that will be achieved because there's a sort of balance with income from the growth company coming in, and also uh, capital receipts will make up any kind of shortfall. And we, we're confident that, that that will be achieved. So therefore, the 1.65 million of savings are forecast to, to be achieved. Okay. Table four, then show just a list of reserves under the, under the, under the, under the directorate. Um, apologies for some of the kind of initials. Um, AMGMT Community Fund Cat is the community asset transfer to asset management, and there's a small balance there. There's a number of sort of reserves we have. Um, during the year, these will be pulled down and, and we we'll start to complete. You'll see there that the, the use reserves is, is blank at the moment as, as, as a contributions, but as the year progresses, that will begin to get filled in. So there's 1.985 million of, of reserves under under, under the control of the committee, uh, over a number of areas there. Um, and then table, f table five then, just to go in there, is, is the kind of capital budget. Um, the first column of numbers, the budget is at the beginning of the year at March. So, so, when, so when the budget was set in March, capital was 30.638 million pounds. Um, and we've now got a forecast outturn of 17.5 million pounds. So there's some variances. Um, some schemes have been have moved around, so uh, the big the big variances there, for example, are future high streets fund. Um, there's a reprofile of how that's going to be spent, so that's going to be back into later years. So rather than being spent in 21-22, it's going to be into, into later years. Um, similarly, with things like the strategic acquisitions fund, we have a fund to, to acquire property, and um, that's kind of just available to us. But kind of forecasting what's going to happen to it, that will also move forward. And we've had one or two kind of new schemes added during the year, which went in the, in, in the original budget. So, for example, P P Policy Resources Committee in late March agreed to the uh, to a scheme for the Maritime Knowledge Hub within Wales Waters. So that's an additional budget or additional amount of money coming in. Um, and also things like like the Hand Street Movement Strategy is another one there. So at the moment, then um, we're kind of forecasting 17.5 million pounds, which is say 13.138 different to the beginning of the year. Okay. They're the kind of major variances. Um, the recommendations basically are to, are to note the, the position for revenue of £20,000, uh, favourable, favourable variance, uh, to note progress on, on the savings, to note the reserves, and, and to note the, the year and forecast capital forecast. Yeah, that's a quick summary of the report. Thank you, Peter. Very comprehensive report. 
and given the fact that we are requested to note the recommendations, are there any observations or comments that members have before we move to note the listed recommendations? No. Can I have a proposer and seconder that we no thank you, Councillor Mitchell, for proposing. Someone seconding? Councillor Hodson, thank you. Are we content to do that by assent? Yes? Any against? No? That's unanimous then. Thank you. And can I thank you, Peter, for your patience uh, and the length of time it's taken us to get to actually present your report. It is appreciated. Thank you. That brings us to item 12 then. The work programme, pages 169 to 176. And it says here, I am to open this report. I think the report speaks for itself. If you've read it, which I'm sure you have, you'll note there's quite a hefty work programme, quite a hefty workload there. I have been asked a question about close-out dates and dates associated with the work programme, which I have taken on board, and I will discuss with officers about the dates for some of the close-out and some of the completion dates. Can I ask if any of our committee have any observations, comments or questions about our work programme. No? Take the silence as acquiescence then. Can I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Someone to formally propose, Councillor Burgess Joyce. Someone to formally second, Councillor Mitchell. Thank you both very much. Uh, can I ask if we can agree this by assent? Excellent. Thank you very much. Can I, before we move on to the next two items, remind members that the next two items are exempt. I have an obligation to read out the following. That under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following items of business on the grounds that they are likely to involve disclosure of exempt information as defined by paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12a as amended to the act the public interest has been applied and favors exclusion can i ask committee members if they are happy to go into a closed session and can we agree this by assent? Agreed? Councillor Bird. Could it be explained why there's a public interest in keeping the second item out of the public domain? Thanks. Yes, I'm sure it can. I'll ask our legal representative. Thank you. The, um, yeah, which one is that? Which one, which one is that? Yeah, there, there are, there are, yeah, there are clear commercial considerations in terms of the uh, the, the alignments that are uh, are considered in terms of uh, various land holdings, and, um, and and for that reason, um, it's recommended that um, that the matter is debated um, in, uh, in in exempt. I don't know if Alan's got anything to to, to add to that. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, but we're not in part two yet, so. Thank you, Councillor Hodson. We haven't actually gone into the, the exempt yet. We're, we're, uh, we're considering Councillor Bird's question, which, Matthew, you've answered. Councillor Bird, are you happy with the reply you've received? I don't really understand it, so, and I'm not, I'm not, what I do understand, I'm not particularly happy with. I don't see why the matter can't be discussed in as a normal committee item. It is, it is difficult to, uh, to to actually set out the reasons in a, in a public forum. Um, uh, that, that, that's, that's the difficulty. 
Um, but um, there, are, there are some commercial um, land interests that are involved in terms of the various options that could be affected um, by, by the Okay. Uh, by the Thank you, Matthew. Suffice to say, then, there are commercial sensitivities and confidenti confidentialities around the issue. Uh, it's my intention that we go into a closed session, and I'd like that agreeing by assent, if possible. If not, I'll go for a proposal and seconder, and we'll actually do it by a vote. Well, can we agree by assent? Are there any abstentions? Councillor Bird abstains. Everyone else in agreement? Thank you, members. Uh, given we are now about to go into closed session, can I ask our officers...